we got everything fixed here. All right, testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. <clears throat> testing, test. All right. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. Hello, friends. My name is Lucas Mann, and uh, I'm one of the pastors at uh, at Poplar Springs Baptist Church. It's about four miles down the road that way. And myself uh, and my uh, my co-pastor and a couple of friends of mine are out here this afternoon to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ, to preach to you the gospel of grace. Uh, the Bible talks about proclaiming openly that, that God calls his people to preach his message openly. And so here we are on a street corner in this small town to make known this precious truth to you, my friends. We do it because we care for you, uh, because we care for God. We know that God has so loved us, has so sent his son into the world to save sinners, that he has graciously sent him to, to die for our sins. And so we are filled with gratitude and we want you likewise to experience this salvation that we have been given, this great salvation. In fact, the book of Hebrews calls it so great a salvation, a perfect salvation. And we come out here to call you to repent to turn from your wicked ways, to turn from your wicked deeds, and to take part in this great salvation, to believe upon this Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We plead with you that you would turn and have life eternally. Jesus does not come to sinners and offer them ease of life and financial prosperity and freedom from uh, medical difficulties. Rather, Jesus comes and offers sinners forgiveness of sin. He offers sinners forgiveness of sin and life everlasting to be brought into the presence of the Father forevermore. And we come out here with that hope, with that hope in ourselves, knowing that we have been redeemed by His grace. I don't preach uh, as if upon a pedestal, as if I was better than you. My friends, I know that I am, I am the chief of sinners. I am the sinner of sinners. I am the worst and the most vile amongst you. But Jesus Christ has been gracious to me, and He has saved me from my sins. He has redeemed me by His grace, and I know that He likewise can do the same for you. Paul says this, this, this exact thing in Romans 1.16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, for it is the power of God, the, the dunamis of God, the life-changing power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to every person, whether white or black or rich or poor, or famous or unknown. The gospel is the same gospel, and it is the very power of God for your salvation, my friends. And the gospel, succinctly put, is that Jesus Christ saves sinners. Jesus Christ saves sinners. And we have all sinned, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all rebelled against God's created order. We have rebelled against God's holy law, that which is a reflection of His perfect character. We have lied and stolen, and we are blasphemers by nature, and adulterers, and fornicators, and idolaters. And we deserve hell. We deserve to be cast into the lake of fire forever, to be tormented to receive upon ourselves the wrath of God. Yet God in His mercy sends His Son to take the place of sinners upon the cross, to bear the wrath that we justly uh, are due, that, that we ought to, to take upon ourselves. Christ took upon His own shoulders, and He satisfied the wrath of God. We know that when Jesus died, He said, Tetelestai, that is, it is finished. There is no more debt to be paid. But for all of those for whom, for, for who would believe in Jesus Christ, he accomplished total redemption. And he rose from the dead three days later, and he is seated at the right hand of God in heaven today and reigns as king. Jesus Christ is the king of glory. We know that there's a lot of controversy oftentimes surrounding the American president. It's not just with Trump. It's been like that even when Obama was president and the president before him and so on and so forth. It's always been a, an issue of contention. Who, who's the leader in America? But my friends, ultimately it doesn't matter because Christ Jesus is the king and he reigns and he rules and he gives a decree as king and says, for those of you who are lost, who are steeped in sin, who live lives of iniquity and who are, who are, who are uh, as it were, swimming in the sewer of unrighteousness, he calls you to turn and to live. And He as King will receive you. He as King will have mercy upon you. 
and he will receive you to himself in grace and forgive you of your sins, my dear friends. Many of you are living in, in horrible sin, sexual sin. You have filthy mouths. You're, in, you're, you're involved in drug abuse and alcoholism. And your life is a worthless life. It's being used on vain things. And that breaks our hearts to see. But friends, we love you. And we don't want you to go to hell for your sins. God has made provision. God has sent His Son, His only begotten Son, the Redeemer, to die in the place of vile sinners like you and I. Repent. Turn from your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Many churches in this very community won't tell you that. They'll comfort you with lies, but they won't wound you with the truth. But my friends, I'll, I'll be the one. I'll offend you. I'll offend you because I know it's for your betterment. I know it's for your good in the end. I'll tell you something that may upset you. It may make you hate me. But friends, I have to tell you, I'm bound. I'm a slave of Christ. I have no other, no other duty. I have no other choice but to tell you this truth. Christ is Lord. And He is a gracious Lord. He is a compassionate Lord. He is a compassionate King. And He is a loving Savior. And He receives those who turn. Oh, inhabitants of where shoals. This is a wicked city. This is a wicked city filled with unrighteous people doing unrighteous things. This place is wicked. This place is wicked, wicked, wicked. And it's, it's a mercy of God that the, that the very flames from heaven don't come down and consume every last one of you here. It's only a mercy of God that His wrath is not immediately poured out on this city. And the whole place burned to a crisp. But dear friends, Jesus Christ is Savior. He'll save you, sir, from your sins. Even in your old age, you need salvation. Both old and young, come to Christ Flee the wrath which is to come. Don't lose your soul for your sins, dear friends. Don't abandon the precious life God has given you. He has endowed you with life and breath and a will to live, dear friends. Please hear my cries. Hear my cries. They're made in love toward you, dear friends. You, sir, repent and turn to the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He promises to save you from your sins and give you life everlasting. Heaven is a place of unending pleasure. Why would you choose hell for a mere moment of pleasure? He is a fool who drinks a sea of wrath for a drop of pleasure. Don't enjoy a short life of sin to only live in torment for all eternity in hell under the fierce wrath of God. And God is a God of wrath. God certainly loves. God is a God of love. But He is also a God of wrath. And His wrath is kindled against sin. And the only salvation from the wrath of God is in Jesus Christ. He bore the wrath. He cried out in the garden. He said, let this cup pass from me. He is anticipating, drinking the cup of God's wrath. We find all throughout the Old Testament that the wrath of God is pictured as a cup. And Jesus here says, Father, if it's your will, let it pass from me. But he drank it irregardless in submission to the Father's will. Does this truth grip, does this truth grip you, my friends? Has it changed your life? Has the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ radically changed your life, the makeup of who you are? Or are you a hypocrite? Are you a church? going hypocrite like all these people in wear shoals. Like all these churchgoers at the at the First Presbyterian Church and at the United Methodist Church and the Baptist churches in wear shoals. Are you like them? Are you like the, the people who go sit on the, on the pew on Sunday and they sing the songs and they believe what the preacher says but the rest of the week they're liars and deceivers and fornicators and adulterers and idolaters. They worship football and they're drunkards and they watch pornography. Let me tell you something, friends. When you delete your search history, God has a record of it. When you close that incognito tab, God sees it. God knows your sins. And those of you who claim to be followers of Christ, but you live in this way, you're hypocrites. Jesus said there will be many on the day of judgment who will say, Lord, Lord. And he says, I will say to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Dear friends, many of you are hypocrites. Many of you are false Christians, are false followers of Christ. You were like I was. I was a hypocrite for years of my life. And I was steeped in sin and, and lostness and, and, and immorality 
and drunkenness, and God pulled me out of that and saved me and gave me a new heart with new desires. That's the evidence, the evidence of conversion. That's that. That's the evidence of salvation that you have a new life and new desires and new intentions and new inclinations that God has done a work in you. Jesus said, the good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Do you want to know what kind of tree that you are? Do you want to know whether you're a legitimate person, a Christian or not, a legitimate follower of Christ? Look at your deeds. And if in the light of Scripture you are found wanting, it is because you truly are found wanting and you truly are lost. Come and live. Come and have life eternally in Christ Jesus I want to look at a passage out of Romans in Romans chapter 3. Romans 3.21, Paul writes this. He says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This is, he's speaking of salvation through Christ, because he says in verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. It's a free gift of eternal life, dear friends. A free gift. Jesus Christ gives a righteousness, a, a, a alien righteousness, a righteousness that is not your own to you if you merely believe that he is gracious enough to do it, and surely he is. Sir, you need to be saved from your sins too, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. He says in verse 22, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. That is, propitiation means wrath has been absorbed. Christ is the propitiatory Lamb of God who absorbed in His body, absorbed in Himself the wrath of God so that sinners like you and me, sir, could be forgiven and set free from slavery to sin. You know, Jesus said that whoever sins is the slave of sin, slave to their drunkenness, slave to their love and idolatry of sports. But if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed, dear sir. And he says this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What Paul is saying here is this, is that God, in saving sinners through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has proven to be both just and gracious. God can be both wrathful and merciful. God can be holy and loving. Because at the cross... We see that God the Son, eternal God, God of very God, bears the wrath that we deserve. And in light of that, we receive forgiveness so that God's justice is appeased. The law is appeased. The wrath of God is absorbed and we receive mercy and grace. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts all because Christ toiled. All because Christ bled upon Calvary's cross. He even cried out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And that is the character of God revealed in the gospel. See, God is not like you and I conceive him, conceive of him to be. Oftentimes, our bent as sinners is to formulate a God who suits our desires and our lusts in our own minds. I mentioned earlier that we, we have no problem accepting God as gracious and loving. That's easy. Everybody does that. But the minute we begin to think about the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the wrath of God, then we say, oh no, I don't worship that God. You know what we're doing? We're idolaters. We're worshiping a false God. Where we go to learn about God is not our own imagination or even the thoughts of, of preachers and theologians. We go to the Word of God and we see God has said, I am holy. I am holy. Isaiah, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6, when he sees the Lord in heaven, when he has a vision of God in heaven, he says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the God of glory, the God of heaven and earth before whose eyes sinners cannot stand, in whose presence sin will not dwell. And my friends, you think on the day of judgment you'll be safe. 
The only place that you'll be safe on the day of judgment, the only place you could possibly be safe is in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. The name of Jesus Christ in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. Jesus is the, the ark of salvation in the Old Testament. We find a record in the book of Genesis that God saw the wickedness of men upon the earth that it was so exceedingly great that he decided to destroy all of the earth and all the inhabitants therein with a great worldwide flood. And he commanded a man by the name of Noah to erect a wooden ark. And it was in that ark that he and his family would have salvation from these horrible, devastating floods. And you know what happened? Noah obeyed, made the ark, and when the floods came and the waters came, they took refuge in that boat and they were saved from God's wrath against the enemy. And we see there God's mercy and love directed against his elect. Do you know what, my friends, today Jesus Christ is that ark of salvation for you and I to embrace him. And friends, if you don't embrace Christ, if you don't run into the ark of salvation, if you don't find refuge in him, my friends, it will be a fearful thing on the day of wrath. You think it's cool to curse, to be a drunkard and a drug abuser, to listen to that disgusting country music? You think it's cool and you think it's fun, my friends? But on the day of wrath, those things will cease to be as enjoyable and you will realize they earned you an eternity of torment. Friends, don't go to hell. Don't go to hell. Don't go to hell in your sins. Do you know, I'm, it grieves me to know that many Christians, many so-called Christians fail to share the gospel with their neighbor. It grieves me to know that all these churches in this community, out of all of them, we're the only church that come out here and preach open air. Do you know what they're saying? Do you know what those churches are saying to you as a community? They're saying, go to hell. Go to hell because they won't tell you the good news. I'm going to stand out here and look like a, a complete idiot in public. I'm going to look like an idiot in front of you because I care for you. I want you to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care that I look stupid. I'll stand on a street corner and preach to you this message even if you don't want me to because I love you. Listen to me, friends. Jesus Christ saves sinners. You're a sinner. You need to realize this about yourself, that you are woefully, you are woefully sinful you have fallen short of the glory of god that is the weightiness the word glory in hebrew means kabod it's a, it's the weightiness of god who god is and we have so drastically so overwhelmingly fallen short of that great character of god that his wrath is kindled against us but there is mercy and grace in the Redeemer. There is, I serve a great Redeemer. I serve a great Lord. He's powerful. He has all power. Scripture says he upholds all creation, all the cosmos, all the stars, every plant and animal and human being in the world by the word of his power. He merely speaks and everything's held up. We find in Genesis, God spoke and the, the very stars of heaven suspended themselves. All the cosmos leapt into existence when God said, let there be light. God commanded that all things were made, my friends. This God is all powerful and you have to deal with him on the day of judgment. Sir, do you have sin? Do you have sin before God? Not all of us are saved. Jesus said there are only a few that will be saved. Have you lied? Have you broken God's law? Have you stolen? Have you lied? Have you stolen? Have you broken God's law? His Ten Commandments? I have too. Do you know where we deserve to go? We deserve to go hell. But God sent the Redeemer to bear the wrath that you and I deserve to be poured out on us in hell. And Jesus rose from the dead. You, what you must do is turn from your life of sin. The sin that you've committed, it is not a delight. It's not a joy. Turn from it and look to Jesus Christ. You may say that you're a follower of Christ, but you may be addicted to pornography. You may be a drunkard. You may be sexually immoral. I don't know. You may be a hypocrite. And Jesus calls hypocrites to believe in him as well. And he will save them. God bless you, sir. I love you, sir. I only say this because I love you. I care for you people. Turn to the Redeemer. Turn to the Lord of glory. And be saved. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.5, 
He says, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. Christ was given as a ransom to satisfy the justice of God's law so that sinners could enjoy eternal blessings in his presence, in the presence of God forever. Friends, come! Come to the just and justifier of the wicked. Come to the God of grace, the God of glory, the God of truth. And he will have mercy on you. He is so holy, so perfect. He gave his law. He said, you shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. You shall not fornicate. And we break these laws. You have broken these laws, you sinners. You have transgressed these laws and you're headed for hell. You're headed for destruction in hell. But Jesus Christ laid down his life. He laid down his life for sinners. Isaiah 53 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. It says in the next verse, As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Dear friends, Christ's very soul, he was in spiritual anguish on that cross so that sinners would not be in spiritual anguish in hell. He rose from the dead. Christ Jesus is alive today. Jesus is alive. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Charles Taze Russell is dead. All the other religious leaders throughout all the ages who ever claimed to be anything, they're all dead. Jesus Christ is alive. No, we'll, you won't find any bones in the ground. You won't find a tomb that's still sealed. You'll find the tomb has been opened. The stone has been rolled away and Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness does not comprehend it, does not overcome it. Dear friends, and I call you that because I care for you. It's an endearing term. I call you my friends and plead with you to believe upon the one who has defeated death. By his death, he has put to death death. He has abolished death so that all who believe in him will be raised to life eternally. Will be raised to life eternal. Life everlasting. Life incorruptible, my friends. God has implanted within you a will to live, my friends. Though your will is utterly corrupted by sin, and you are bent toward that which is evil, yet you have a will to live. Let that God-given will to live push you to come to Christ Jesus. Let that God-given will push you to flee your sin and to believe on Christ. It is all by grace, not by works of the law are we justified, not by the works of our hands. As the old hymn says, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. My friends, nothing you can do could possibly commend you to God. You and I are too wicked. You and I are too perverted. You and I are too prideful. You and I are too ungodly. We need a perfect Redeemer. We need a perfect work. And we need perfect salvation. And Christ provides all of it free of charge. Although there is a paradox because he also says, if you were to come after me, you must deny yourself. Though salvation is free, following after Jesus Christ will cost you your life. Everything that you have comes under the scope of his lordship, under the scrutiny of his reign and rule, and you have no will of your own. That's why I'm out here today. It's a Saturday. I could just be relaxing at home, getting chores done, things of the like, watching TV. But I am Christ's slave, and I don't have a will of my own. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Christ bought me. And I'm his. And he says, go and preach. And I must go. So friends, come. We're here to pray for you. We've got a, gr a large group of people out here. We're, we want to pray for you. We want to give you a gospel track. We want to invite you to my church. I pastor Poplar Springs Baptist Church. Just a couple miles down the street. Poplar Springs Baptist Church. Even my co-pastor's here with me. We want to pray for you. We'd love for you to come and worship with us, to worship the living God. Turn from your sin, my friends. Turn and live and have life. I want to continue reading out of Romans 3 because then Paul says in verse 27, he says, where then is boasting is excluded? By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith 
apart from works of the law. It is all freely of grace. Any religious system or so-called Christian religion or Christian preacher that says salvation is somehow a result of your work is a lie. It's a lie. Anyone who tells you that is a liar. Paul says they're a curse. They're anathema if they preach another gospel. The only true gospel is the gospel of grace. Paul says in Acts 20, 24, that he's been set apart by God to preach the gospel of God's grace, God's unmerited favor. Not favor that is worked for, not favor that is earned, favor that is unmerited, that has been worked for by Christ. Jesus lived, not only did he die, not only did Jesus die, but he lived a life of perfect obedience to the law of God. He fulfilled all righteousness as we find in the book of Matthew. He came to fulfill the law of God, not to abolish it. And in that fulfilling of the law, he procured a righteousness. He brought about a righteousness that is a perfect righteousness. And when those, when, when sinners turn from their sin and believe upon him, Jesus gives them that righteousness. He imputes to them the righteousness of God, his very own righteousness as a gift of grace so that God sees the sinner as perfect in his sight. He sees them as righteous. My friends, God can look upon you today and see perfect righteousness because of Jesus Christ. Even you, young lady. Even you. Jesus calls the young ones. The, he talks about, let the children come to me. You were called by God to repent, to turn from your own sin and believe upon the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is all by faith. By faith. By faith was Abraham himself justified. And all the saints ever since then, likewise also. I want to mention something I mentioned earlier, and it's addressing hypocrites. My friends, unfortunately, especially here in Ware Shoals, we're in the Bible Belt. We're in, we're in Christianity Central, or so we're told. Churches are everywhere. We got two right here just in eye shot. But yet, we are, this is an ungodly place. Ware Shoals is an ungodly city. We live in an ungodly county. How can that be? It's because there are many who name the name of Jesus Christ, but they are hypocrites. They are blatant hypocrites. There are many pastors who will go to hell. There are many deacons who will go to hell. And there are many church callers and choir directors and choir members that will go to hell. Why? Because they're hypocrites. They say they follow Jesus Christ. They say they believe the gospel. But they live as though he never gave them a law to obey. They live as though he doesn't exist. They, they're practical atheists. And that is the state of many churches today in Ware Shoals. A majority of these churches in Ware Shoals are filled with people, and perhaps you're one of them, that say they're Christians, but they are blatant Hypocrites. They don't care anything about reading the Bible. They don't care anything about praying or sharing the gospel with the lost. They don't care anything about holiness, being separate under the Lord. They just want to live like every other Southern Baptist or every other um, Presbyterian in this area or every other United Methodist. They just want to live like everyone else. Just keep with the status quo when God calls his people to be separate, to be set apart. Dear friends, please. Heed this cry. Heed my, heed my cries. They're, they're made with, with great sincerity. Come. Turn from your hypocrisy. Turn from your rebellion. Turn from your sins and have life in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 27, He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. This is, this is something that's exclusive. Verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These are people who are churchgoers. Turn, you hypocrites. Repent of your false Christianity. 
and come to the living Christ. Come to the true Christ. And he'll save you because I was once a hypocrite. I was once a false Christian. And God saved me and he can save you. What is the end to this? Why has God condescended in any way to save sinners? Why has God chosen in his grace to send his son to allow him to die such a painful death, to be raised from the dead, to be exalted once more at his right hand in heaven? It's to his own glory. God condescends to save sinners to his glory. That's the end to which you and I have been created, my friends. We've been created to glorify God, to worship, to honor, to adore and to enjoy God forever. That's our chief end, my friends. My, my exhortation to you today is to believe on Jesus Christ to the glory of God. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to the glory of God. Five centuries ago, something very significant happened, and that was the Protestant Reformation. One of the slogans that the Protestants came up with in their protesting against the Roman Catholic Church was a, a Latin phrase, sola deo gloria. That is, to God alone be the glory, or to God al uh, to, to alone to God may the glory be brought. My friends, and that's what we are to be, that is what we are to be after, to be pursuing. Our lives are to the end that we are to glorify God, my friends. That we are to live to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are to believe upon God's Son. What is the work of God that He requires? To believe in Him whom He has sent. Dear friends, glorify God with me today. Come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and, and ascribe to Him the glory for these great things that He has done. Paul puts it this way in Romans 11. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became His counselor? Or who was first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We do say to God be the glory forever. Dear friends, I want you to know that my name is Lucas Mann. L-U-C-A-S-M-A-N-N. -N, and I am one of the pastors at Poplar Springs Baptist Church. It's about four miles down this way right outside of town, Poplar Springs Baptist Church. And we invite you to come to our church to worship with us, to hear more of the Word of God preached. We only believe in preaching the Word of God, preaching the Bible, just like you've heard today. Preaching the Scriptures. We want to reason with you from the Scriptures. So tomorrow's the Lord's Day. Tomorrow's the Christian Sabbath. Tomorrow is God's appointed day for worship. We'd invite you to come and worship with us. It's 11... Uh, 11 a.m. We also worship in the evening at 7. Please come. But the stronger exhortation I give you is not to come to a church, but to come to the Redeemer of the church, to come to the Lord of the church, to come to the head of the church, and that's Jesus Christ. Oh, dear friends, I say that because I care for you. Come and have life. Thank you.